Well, now we turn to another threat endangering the lives of many, and that is war, this time through the lens of a journalist who was on the ground. From the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan to the famine in Sudan, award-winning correspondent Jane Ferguson has covered countless conflicts on the front lines. In her new book, No Ordinary Assignment, she writes about navigating feelings of helplessness while remaining confident in the impact of her work. And she joins Hari Srinivasan to discuss what it's like being a female war reporter. Jane Ferguson, author and uh, journalist, we are so happy to have you here. And um, I have to say, in full disclosure, we've worked together before. You are a correspondent of the PBS NewsHour, a program that I'm very familiar with. And it has been remarkable to read this book, No Ordinary Assignment, because it not only taught me a lot about you, uh, things that I didn't know, but also just kind of made me look at our storytelling and our profession a little differently. So. Let's kind of get into it here. First of all, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do? It's a question I always have a very clear answer for, which is pretty much as early as I can remember. I, I don't even really remember thinking of it in the early days as a child, as a career, as a job. I just remember looking at it with the sort of wonderlust of the ability to travel the world and tell stories it seemed to me like an incredible life. And that, you know, I would I would grow up, I talk about this in the book, I would grow up reading about adventurers and and watching the television and and starting to really sort of understand that there were women out there in the world doing this kind of work. And the idea that that I could, you know, join the ranks w w was something that I was caught with very, very early on. And I never really let it go. You didn't have the kind of uh, Ivy League American sort of pedigree that we associate with some of what is traditional network television's foreign correspondent work. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, uh, what life was like. Well, I grew up in very rural Northern Ireland, and it was during what we call the Troubles there, which was a, a time of of great violence and and uh, social unrest as well as as uprisings. So. You know, I was very lucky to be able to 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 access an education that was state funded, that was that was pretty good. But I and I was also lucky enough to sort of grow up in an environment where education was everything, you know, the lower middle classes and the working classes. And it was very much so uh, an important part of our culture was to try to get educated, to raise your kids, to become professionals in that sense. But I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or any of the elite American universities. And I had no idea when I started off uh, becoming a journalist that that would be a, a difficulty, that that would make it a, a lot harder to get in the door, as you would say. Um, I, I managed to, to get my first few jobs in journalism and I moved to the Middle East. But then the financial crisis happened, and that tended to compound that same problem uh, for young people coming up, trying to get into the business, trying to move ahead and find paying work as journalists. It became incredibly difficult because it became apparent that there really is a filter um, for, for young people trying to get in, where if you haven't gone to an elite college or an elite university, or you don't have connections in the industry, it can be extraordinarily difficult. And I'm actually glad I didn't know that when I started out because it would have been so intimidating. Um, so my own naivety was was very helpful along the way. You have reported from some of the most dangerous places, some of the most difficult places for journalists to get into, much less report from. You know, one of the quotes that you have in the book uh, kind of makes us think a little bit about war coverage. Uh, it says, I have known since long before covering wars as a reporter how there are no good and bad sides and that reality is a complex and harsh collection of truths. Morality bends. Give us an example of a place that you went to where perhaps there was kind of a dominant narrative, but when you get on the ground, you see the complexity in things. I think Afghanistan is a very good example. I mean, there are examples all over the world, but, you know, in covering the the sort of post 9-11 world, we really did see, um, you know, the, the the limitations on reporting on, quote unquote, the war on terror. You know, what is a terrorist? You know, what, you know, do our people pro-terrorism, anti-terrorism? The reality is that when you really spend time in places where, you know, you might have been raised thinking of things as black and white, people as good or bad, you do tend to to uh, to see things much too simplistically and too morally. I think it's really important as a reporter to not uh, view our stories through a moral lens. 
And so spending a lot more time in Afghanistan, having the, uh, the luck to be able to live there and really starting to understand the more complex nature of the war there. You know, certainly the Taliban have, uh, you know, used terror tactics again and again. They've been more than willing to sacrifice civilian lives um, and to, to 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 kill civilians as part of their tactics. But at the same time, you know, you, you know, whenever you go into Taliban controlled areas, and this is before they took over the whole country, you know, you talk to people who feel terrorized by some of the government soldiers. You talk to people who feel like they and their own ethnic groups and families and, and broader communities are very much so marginalized. So you do start to see the gray areas in between. And that's really where you want to be as a journalist. You want to be in those gray areas, helping people understand a much deeper level of Taliban versus government, you know, talking about the multi-layered uh, ethnic tensions in those areas, the various tit for tat war crimes that both sides are, uh, are, are guilty of. It's not both sideism and it's not whataboutism, but it's nuance and it's detail and it's helping people understand that, you know, the, the difficult questions that people don't really want to 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 acknowledge. And you write about this in, in Mogadishu. Uh, you had a quote there to stand in a hospital with a camera and not a stethoscope to offer no tangible help to the person suffering in front of you to voyeuristically witness their suffering. All of this is grotesque. And you said this was your first such experience, but you're describing a sort of helplessness that you can't physically you know, improve the situation of that one person. And you've got a camera, not a medical kit. I talked to a lot of my friends uh, in the industry about this. You know, this is our, people often think, oh my goodness, the worst part of your job must be the exhaustion and, and you know, the, the food poisoning and the danger and nothing, nothing of the sort. You know, the worst part of this work is that dangerous whispered doubt Am I making a difference here? You know, um, we're not water engineers, we're not doctors, we're not pilots. Um, and so, yes, there's there, there's often when you're there, this sense of helplessness and sometimes guilt and shame attached to it if, if you're not careful, because. Yes, on a broader scale, we know that we are helping, that we're that we're playing an important role. Uh, and I do believe to my core that that journalism, especially reporting from conflict zones and major crises around the world is important, plays an important role. But the problem is I can't help this person sitting in front of me. I can generally help these people. And, you know, there are moments when you see the impact when it comes to diplomacy and aid and and and, and major, major uh, awareness within populations. But I can't help this person who, who, who I'm filming. And that that's a very, very tough reality to 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 accept um and compounded by the fact that many of us journalists get asked for help all the time because people think we are doctors and nurses and aid workers or are you from the un or the red cross can you help me find my my child it, it's really appalling when you have to say I, i'm so sorry i'm just a journalist and you wave your notepad around and and those moments are very tough to take you said at the fall of Kabul in uh, 2021 that um, a switch flipped for you. You describe it as, um, I didn't want to be a spectator anymore. I refuse to just watch this happen. Um, so often, as journalists, there's this tension that we should not get involved. But in that scenario, what happened that led you to be well, the last American journalists, uh, you and Eric, your cameraman, um, but part of what, maybe eight people that were the last journalists to get out of there on evacuation flights. I think it really is a buildup for me. I think the book hopefully conveyed how this was a sort of moment at the end of a very long string of moments where I have grappled for years with Am I making a difference? Am I helping people? Should I be helping people? What is my role here? But when I was in Kabul, I found a unique moment whereby all of the rules were collapsing. The uh, There was no real system. People spoke English. And so I was able to work with them back and forth. And helping people get out was something that I was it was it was able to, to do. I was in a privileged position of being able to advise them on what paperwork they needed, negotiating for them with the soldiers, pulling them out of the crowd. 
And that was some some small, small way that 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 I could help. And I could do it and do my work in and and file every night a story. And so that was one moment where I just felt like I couldn't live with myself if I can't actually do what is clearly possible right in front of my eyes. And, and, you know, there are things, Harry, that are just so much bigger than your career and your work. And so they become moments in your life where you're aware that you'll remember this forever. I, I want to talk a little bit about the role that gender has played and how it has affected your reporting, because at times you highlight uh, there was a period when you were at Al Jazeera and one of your bosses basically just said, I don't want a woman on that story. And there are other times where you are made to be very conscious of the fact that a woman in this profession has a whole list of other challenges that a man does not when it just comes to succeeding, especially on camera. I always say, Harry, when people ask me, and they ask me a lot, you know, what must it be like working in such conservative countries as a woman? And I always say that, yes, there are challenges. There are certain meetings, social events. There are certain ways of of socializing with men in power that culturally it's harder for me to do. It's harder for me to get in certain rooms sometimes where there's more informal networking and, and you know, male journalists might have, have often have better access. That is very often um, balanced out by the fact that I do actually get access to women. And so I'm lucky that I can I can spend time with women in Afghanistan. I can spend time with women in Yemen, where my male colleagues, uh, for my male colleagues, it's often a total no-no. However, there have definitely been moments in my career where it's very often the news organizations that are that women end up having to contend with. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, there was that moment at Al Jazeera, which was very on the nose, which was very, very uh, in my face. Um, but but very often it's more just inferred. It's it's the fact that that we work in television. It puts so much pressure on women to look a certain way in the field. And that pressure, um, you know, it's a, it's a particularly ageist industry for women, you know, that, that <laughs> having the pressure to look good and then having this ticking clock going on at the same time, the sense that, you know, you must make it by this stage uh, for your career to ever ascend to this. These are pressures that, that, that female journalists carry around with us all the time. I am aware of how absurd it is that I'm standing in a refugee camp um, combing my hair and, 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 you know, applying makeup. I don't think that's normal. Uh, I, I also think it's silly but it is often necessary because we still work in a competitive industry that is very often run by men. And very often women are, in fact, I would say always women are to a certain extent judged by their looks as, as well as their other attributes, their other skill sets. And that is something that, that, that women in the industry, I think whenever we really think about the things that, that, are, that challenge us as, as women, that's what sort of that that is what has the most impact on our careers and therefore causes us the most stress. I wonder about whether you just feel lucky sometimes. I mean, there are, you describe a couple of scenarios that are just kind of eerie. I mean, you the place that you used to live in Beirut, for example, if you'd been there a couple of months longer, it might have been affected by that enormous explosion that we all remember or more tellingly uh, that you were kind of behind the lines in Syria with activists. And after you left, the next crew in there, uh, when they were in there, Marie Colvin, a journalist, uh, was killed in a bombing attack. And, and I wonder, I mean, what does that make you think of when you realize I was standing in the same place that she was and had it not been for timing? I think it makes you extraordinarily grateful. You know, all I can when when I when I answer questions on that, all I can say is, I can't explain it. Um, you know, I I do think living in in particularly spiritual places where you know people do have a very uh, strong uh, close affinity with with religion 
um, has has made me much less obstinate, obstinately um, atheistic as a, as a kid. Um, I've I've certainly come to respect something that is much bigger than me. Uh, however, people want to put that into words, I find that hard to deny. But I also just think all you can do is recognize grace when you see it. If you've been spared for whatever reason, you'll never know. If you've been spared, it's just another even greater reason to be very grateful for your life. I A lot of people ask me if I'm an adrenaline junkie, if I love risk. I certainly don't. I you know, would I, I have a good life and I and I'm I, and I fear death, but I'm also aware of how extraordinarily blessed my life is. Um, and you know, whenever you look back and realize there were moments in your life when it all could have been over, you do look at the quality of your life and your relationships and all the blessings that you have. And I think that I've been lucky to have clarity um, in those moments afterwards, and um, where I just, you know, try not to take my life for granted. You know, uh, and finally, uh, I see that you are an optimist. I mean, I guess reading your memoir, it's hard not to see why you wouldn't be one, considering what you've lived through already. But I wonder what your thoughts are about kind of the state of journalism and foreign coverage today. You know, there's no doubting that television news in its current format is dying and will die very soon. Opinion is cheap. It's so cheap to just have talking heads and people just shouting at one another. I mean, you know, they don't need airline tickets and hotel rooms and camera people and drivers. Um, but I also believe firmly that journalism will survive. It'll survive the jump online. I mean, you know, people are still watching and reading quality journalism. The challenge is trying to figure out a business model around it. How do we make it work so that we can keep doing our work? I don't really care where people watch my stories so long as they watch them. You know, I want to know that that journalism is going to survive. That, uh, And I do think it will whenever you look at the amount of of people who are reading quality newspapers and who are watching, you know, uh, things like uh, even you know, sixty minutes still gets a massive viewership, and so I don't, I don't doubt that things will go online, uh, and and people will continue watching. The difficulty will be seeing what also takes the space as well, um, whether it's extreme opinions on both sides, a lot of of um, of talking, a lot of punditry, a lot of, as you say, misinformation going on social media. I grew up watching the BBC. I believe in public broadcasting and, and non-corporate media will, will, I think, continue to, 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 to play an even more important role in, in, in holding the ground on quality journalism. The book is called No Ordinary Assignment, author and journalist Jane Ferguson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Harry.